Hi, I'm Will Estes. I'm a high school math and science teacher in the U.S., and I'm going to be looking at the math section of the SAT that Simon Dan took. I'm going to be looking at it as if it was a test that I administered and that I now have on my desk and I'm grading. So this first page is what every teacher likes to see. Everything was correct, and that means I don't need to look at it anymore. Everything is good. Five out of five. Next page, a uh, slightly different story, unfortunately. There are four problems, and we've only got three with the correct answer. So whenever there's something that is not correct, that's where I actually have to go look at it because I absolutely love partial credit. The purpose of an assessment is supposed to be to give a student a chance to demonstrate mastery. Basically, the answer is almost kind of an afterthought because what I'm trying to make sure is that the skills have been successfully transferred and that the student knows what they are doing. So I'm a lot more interested in the work and the reasoning process. Now, in the video, Dan was explaining all of his processes, and that was excellent. If that had all been written, of course, that would be loads of partial credit, but I'm just going to go with what is written. And what I see here in this problem is a equation for a line in slope-intercept form and two sketches of lines. So not a lot of work, not a whole lot showing me the thought process. And so I'm going to give it the minimum amount of partial credit that I can. There being 20 questions to make it work out to a nice even percentage, I'm going to give every question five points, that is five possible points of partial credit. So that one will be one fifth of the way correct, basically, just for showing work. And um, by the way, kids, always show your work. But anyway, uh, this particular question um, is asking about perpendicular lines. And Dan was correct when he said that the slopes of perpendicular lines ought to be negative reciprocals. Now, um, part of uh, his process for this I found fascinating because he noted when it said slope, he said that must mean gradient. And part of what this test is, is it's an admissions test for American high schoolers into American colleges. This is very, very much part of the American education system. And so there's different notation, different vocabulary all over the world. I'm sure, particularly between America and Europe, I remember um, tutoring a uh, student from France in some math, and she had a totally different way of doing long division that I had seen. And so if you're taking a test that was designed for a different educational system than the one you were raised in, of course, that's going to cause uh, some issues. But of course, Dan knows this stuff and he was doing pretty well, except for just this thing. He got the slope right, but the y-intercept is off. When x equals 4 and you substitute 4 into the equations for c and d, then you'd find that um, the y value in c is only negative 2. In fact, you need to add 4 like you have in d to bring that value up to positive 2. So that was really it. He got the slope right, but missed out on the y-intercept. So I'm going to give him some partial credit for showing his work and moving on. The next page has two questions. We are going to not add any points on this one because neither question was answered correctly. However, I am going to award some partial credit for that first problem because there is an awful lot of work shown. Now, when I'm looking at work, I like to describe what I call smart mistakes and dumb mistakes. And um, I, of course, never, you know, pick on people saying that was a dumb mistake because that's really just insulting. Rather, I'm trying to encourage people by saying, you've made a smart mistake. In other words, you've made the kind of mistake that only people who know what they are doing would make. Now, this is language I use with students. Obviously, Dan's an adult. He can handle it. But um, when I'm trying to encourage students to learn, there are mistakes and then there are, you had no idea what you were doing, <laughs> right? The kind of problem that we're solving here this is a rational function, meaning it is a ratio of two polynomials. And the way that that works is only the numerator of a fraction can make the fraction equal to zero. When the numerator of a fraction is zero, doesn't really matter what the denominator is, 
you're getting zero unless and the denominator is the one that can mess that fraction up if the denominator is zero then we're dividing by zero and that's an error so if the denominator is zero that's when you get a discontinuity it looks like he showed in his work he knew to use those x values to substitute in and see what came out but he was misinterpreting the answer so i'm just looking at that thinking he knew what kind of problem this was he started this off right but he lost his way in the middle so i'd like to give half credit but since the misunderstanding was more fundamental that it was about the denominator versus the numerator right it wasn't just a simple arithmetic mistake it was a conceptual mistake i'm going to give less than half and since there are five points i'll just give um two out of five instead of three out of five okay now um the uh next problem is about an exponential graph and it asks the value of a to subtract um, from 2 to the x so that it appears to have a y-intercept of 3. Um, totally makes sense that you'd fall for this, um, that you would have to subtract 3 in order to have a y-intercept of negative 3. It's just that the typical y-intercept for an exponential growth function is 1 because um, any base to the power of zero equals one. So you'd have to shift that down four to get that down to negative three. Very easy mistake to make, um, but there wasn't any work shown at all. One such a you know simple question, don't know why you would, but anyway, that's why I can't give any credit to that. Sorry, Dan. All right, next page, four questions. And once again, none of them correct, but there is some work shown. Let's see if I can give any partial credit. Let's discuss these questions. The first one says that there is a graph. It's relating some facts about fish, like their tail area and their length. And it's asking which equation best matches that graph. Now, all four equations are very, very similar. They're all just parabolas, basically, with only a leading coefficient and then the variable squared, and then there's no bx and there's no c. So this is actually kind of simple. This is just a test of whether you know what the leading coefficient of a parabola does. So just choose any point that you can identify the coordinates of. And it looks like I can see um, 15, 5. That looks like a point that we could pick out there. If x were 15 and you squared that, that would be 225. The y value is only 5, which means you would have to make that way smaller. In other words, if you have the leading coefficient of the, of the parabola, it makes the parabola go like that. Um, I've, I've got a video explaining how that works in standard form the, that you can see. But that's what the leading coefficient does. And in order to bring 225 all the way down to 5, we need to really flatten that parabola out. And that means that the leading coefficient needs to be a really small fraction. Choice A is the only one that is a fraction. So uh, choice B, it's 1.23. It's up a little bit. Choice C, 2, it's up even a little bit more. D is up a little bit more. We need to flatten that out. So that's why A is the best choice with uh, for that question. Uh, the next question. This is one that I'm pleased to be able to award a lot of partial credit on because of all of the work that was done and also how correct that work was that it was done properly and that he should have been doing it. So he's got a system of equations and we're looking for the value of X. So uh, he did a great job of getting the X um, coefficients the same, tripling the top one, multiplying the bottom by eight and getting them to be 24 and canceling out. The only problem is that he eliminated X and found Y. And I think that the test makers kind of saw that error coming because those jerks put the value of Y as one of the choices. And so that's the one that he chose. Instead, what he should have done is substituted that value of Y into the equation to solve for X. Alternatively, 
um, modify the equations to eliminate y first, but you know, why waste that work? Anyway, since all of that work was well done and actually was leading towards the answer, it didn't demonstrate some sort of fundamental misunderstanding of the concept, I would give more than half credit. It's not as if he almost got the answer, so I give him four out of five. This is more like a three out of five situation. Okay, the uh, next problem is another system of equations, and it's asking about the value of k. In that bottom line, that would be the slope. If you were to graph those equations, they would be two lines. In order to have exactly one solution, those lines can't have the same slope. So that's why two won't work. It has to be five. And so that's actually letter B, two only, right? K cannot equal two and result in exactly one solution. Okay, so the problem after that one, this is another one with an exponential function in it. And I really love this question because it's asking you to interpret the equation. This is like my favorite approach to functions is interpreting them. Um, physics is uh, my, my main subject. And I like to think of, you know, I majored in physics being I majored in word problems because it was almost um, the curriculum was almost identical to the uh, math majors um, in terms of the classes. It was just a whole lot more, you know, application and like physical interpretation. Love interpreting equations as a way of making sense of them. And it is asking for the best interpretation of the number 1.11. That is the base of the exponent. So we're really asking in an exponential function, a times b to the x, what does the b mean? Well, the way that I interpret that is start with A and then multiply by B X number of times. In other words, you're just repeatedly multiplying A by B, you know, once, twice, three times, four times, X times. So B is your growth factor. That is the best way to interpret that. That's choice D. Um, it grows by a factor of approximately 1.11 or like, you know, 11% basically. Okay, so the next page, actually the last page, has five questions. Now, this is not multiple choice, uh, frankly. I personally hate multiple choice questions on math tests because I, I, I feel like that just is for the purpose of making it easier for a teacher to grade. Um, doing a math problem for me is more like writing an essay. It's that kind of thought process of starting with simple and synthesizing it into something complex. So as far as I'm concerned, these are the five first real math problems. But anyway, on an SAT, you actually have a bubble sheet where you can fill these in. Um, not worrying about all that. I'm just going to take the answers as written. So these five questions... Two of them, we've got full credit, so that's good. We don't need to look at those, and Dan's explanation of them is just fine. But for the remaining three, we've got to take a look at those. Okay, this is perhaps the most complicated question so far. It is the graph of a circle. So this is quadratics, right? This would be in the end of like Algebra 2, even in pre-calculus, conic sections. And x squared minus 8x plus y squared minus 10y equals 40 is a circle somehow? Well, yes, it is, because standard form is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals the radius squared. What you need to do is add 16 to complete the square of x and add 25 to complete the square of y. So if you're adding 16 and 25, the right side of the equation becomes 81. And then the left side, you can factor into those two perfect squares. The radius squared is 81, so the radius is 9. Okay, so the next question is actually kind of annoyingly simple because when you add the solutions to the quadratic equation, the plus and the minus cancel out. And you've got negative b over 2a twice. In other words, negative b over a, which in this case is 6. Unfortunately, I can't give Dan a lot of partial credit here because he didn't get the quadratic formula right. Okay, moving on. We've got a very complicated exponential expression, and it says that A is constant, and the expression is equivalent to x to the sixth. 
Basically, this is testing students on how well they know the properties of exponents. And a couple of them would be um, when you raise an exponential expression to another exponent, then those two exponents multiply together. And also that the um, way to change a radical into an exponent is just that you have the reciprocal of that number, you know, that that, that exponent for the um, for the radical just becomes your new exponent. Anyway, when you combine all of that in that way, you end up with x to the three halves a. And if that's equal to x to the six, then by what's called the one to one property, six must be equal to three a over two. And so a equals four. All right, now that I've finished correcting it, I wanna talk about how to interpret the score. I was able to give Dan some partial credit, but remember, this was not a math test being administered in a math class. This was the SAT, which has a completely different scoring system. The SAT is scored out of 1600, where there are two sections, a math and then an English you know, writing reading, which each give you 800 points. The minimum score you get on every section is 200 points, and that's for getting no questions right, whether they're left blank or answered wrong, which means a perfect score on the math section would be 800. Having answered half the questions correctly, we'd be looking at more like a 500, which is actually an average score. So this is a test that is given to high school students for whom the material is fresh and a reflection of their country's educational system. Not someone who has not been doing this professionally or recreationally for a long time. It's also not geared toward any kind of specific problem or application. It's just how much math education do you know? And so the fact that someone in that position can get an average score is frankly impressive. And and in terms of how it reflects on their ability to do other kinds of technical work, you know, for example, debunking flat earth or something, that kind of problem solving is one in which you know what the problem is ahead of time, you research the math and the methods needed to properly solve it, and then you apply it without any kind of clock overhead making you sweat and rush. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Dan, massive props for taking this test, showing your process, and posting the results for everyone to see the way you did. I'd be very curious to see how a flat earther would do if they tried this themselves. Very curious about that. Anyway, I do math and science here on this channel. I've been posting material on parabolas every Friday of this month because I've also made a cover of Tool's song Parabola on my music channel as if it was literally about parabolas as in from algebra. Anyway, like I said, hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time.